30 participants at the moment. Numbers are going up nicely. What's the time? How is the time doing? Oh. <laughs> Well, we've still got a couple of minutes to go, so we'll wait for some more people to join us. 32, the numbers are going up. Thirty-three. Are you are you on mute, Ken, or can you talk? <laughs> Can't hear you. How's that? That's better. Pretty good. <clears throat> Always good to uh, have people listening. <laughs> Thirty six. Thirty-seven. We'll give it another two or three minutes and then we'll get underway. Give people a chance to come in. Thirty nine, going well. Right, there's the time. I think we might as well. Yeah, 1932. Well, anybody who joins us will, will come in automatically, Ken. I've disabled the waiting room. Brilliant. Okay, so, thanks so much, Andrew. I think, uh, welcome to everybody. And Ken, over to you. Thank you. Um, first of all, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'd like to start off by taking you back a few hundred years to Blagden as it was in about 1645. Um, we obviously don't know that much about it. We can deduce some things. The population was probably about 500 people um, divided across the three um, hamlets that make up Blagden, the, the various ends. Obviously, it was very much a farming community. And then as now, it was quite distant from the towns. It's about as far away as you can get from the centres of population. Off the main roads, um, and again, that's quite important for the story. Because of course, in those days, Western Supermare was just a tiny fishing village. It wasn't the, uh, the town we know today. If we look at the church warden's accounts for the year 1645, they show 
a remarkably picture. Remember, of course, that this was in the middle of a war. Yeah, I couldn't hear it. Money facing the gate. They were buying bread and wine for the communion at Christmas, Easter and Whitson. And as they were doing most years back then, they were having to pay for maintenance on the church clock. Because, yes, in those days, Blagden did have a church clock. As far as one can judge from these documents, life was very much as usual for people in Blagden. However, um, however, in December of that year, things changed. A cavalry troop um, from Bristol, from the Bristol garrison, arrived with a bit of paper saying that the village had to quarter 30 men with their horses. Now, for the size of village that I've just outlined, that was a big deal. Um, horses, as much as anything else, uh, took the fodder that was being stored over the winter. And of course, 30 men, by implication, require a lot of food and probably quite a lot of beer. The good news was that the village constable, who was the person elected by the village um, to administer local justice and basically do quite a lot of local bureaucracy, did some homework and discovered that Blackton was being allocated more than its quota compared with the surrounding villages. And he was able to get the number of men and horses reduced to, by a number of 12 down to 18. So that was the good news. The bad news was instead of staying for seven days and nights, they actually stayed for four weeks. So uh, quite an imposition on a population of our size. That is very much within the local context. But what I want to do is to then try and bring us into the much wider context of the Civil War. And if, as I think probably most of the people watching are, you are of a generation where you covered the, the Civil War, however cursorily in your history lessons. Um, I mean, history these days, of course, consists entirely of, of Hitler and Henry VIII. But um, certainly in my day, we, we covered a lot more than that. You probably remember some of the, the big battles, the names of the big battles of the Civil War. Um, you have four of them there with where they, they took place. It's important to realize though that over and above those big battles, everywhere, literally everywhere in the country was involved in the civil wars that took place. Immediately, I'm going to confess and say this is a huge subject. Um, I'm going to be skimming across the surface uh, of many aspects of it, but really trying to give you a feel for what's going on rather than making it more complicated and trying to cover every single aspect. Putting it in a more European context, we've gone from Blagden to the rest of Europe in about three slides, but uh, bear with me. Um, the Thirty Years' War was going on in Europe over this entire period from 1618 to 1648. And this did have considerable implications for the the British Civil War. Many of the um, aspects, many of the reasons for the war were the same or similar. Many of the military leaders in our Civil War had in fact gained their experience on the continent. And many historians would argue that our Civil War was part of a more pan-European aspect. At a more local level, and I mean this is something I will come on to in more detail later on, Somerset did have considerable links with the continent, largely through cloth trade. Uh, and again, I'll say a bit more about that uh, as we get through it. I would also just highlight that our rebellion wasn't the only one to take place during this period. Um, and again, um, the countries there you can see listed all had their own rebellions over the period and news of them uh, and the whole aspect of them would have been brought across to Somerset and the rest of the Britain uh, on the maritime trade that was taking place. 
ideas travel with the trade. So East Anglia, um, ourselves here in Somerset um, and the Southwest generally knew what was going on far more than perhaps Lancashire or other places did. Again, if you did history at the same sort of time as I did, um, you probably think of it as being the English Civil War, 1642 to 1649, Cavaliers versus Roundheads. I would just point out that Wales, Ireland and Scotland were as heavily involved as England. Most of the main battles perhaps took place in England, but Scotland in particular um, was heavily involved. And in fact, the casualties from the war in Ireland per capita were much higher than they were in England. It was a British Isles war, not just an English civil war. And equally, one could happily argue that it didn't end in 19, sorry, in 1649, that um, you know, the Battle of Worcester in 1651 was probably the end of it. But uh, that, that's what I really wanted to say on that subject. Otherwise, we'll go down all sorts of byways. The war, what caused it? Um, now, again, I have to confess that modern historians are still arguing about this. People are still writing books about it. Um, it's one of those subjects which is a, a, a feast for the academic uh, argument. Bringing it as close as one can to Somerset, the main reason I would put forward would be religion and various aspects that came from the religion. Somerset was divided, but certainly amongst the Puritans, there was a very strong anti-Catholic feeling, a feeling against the high church um, and against particularly the, the Catholic elite um, seen to be in London. And it's worthwhile pointing out that um, the king's wife, Henrietta Maria, was actually a Catholic and did have a dispensation to have her own chapel in London with Catholic priests. So that was allied to, um, again, something I'm sure you would have covered in the history lessons if you'd done them, the idea of constitutional government versus the divine right of kings. You know, this is what we associate with Charles I. It is perhaps just worthwhile pointing out that Elizabeth and James I, his father before him, both had to face very similar issues and did actually manage it far better than he did, that he did have this genuine idea that he was divinely appointed and was therefore not able to compromise with Parliament. And the key issue then perhaps as in many other points in history was the right to tax. Um, it was something that we have perhaps resolved now, but at the time was a burning issue. And this was particularly pertinent uh, because of, again, King Charles and his religion. He was desperate to impose a new book of common prayer on Scotland. And just remember, that, of course, he was King of Scotland independently of being King of England. And the two countries weren't in any way merged, but he was the monarch up there. Wars mean money, um, and particularly um, in those days where the cost of equipment was rising quite markedly. And so Charles' need for, need for money was very much linked to his religion, to his idea of having the final say in people's religion and everything that went with it. Bear with me. Um, I don't, I'm not going to be quoting many dates and I'm not going to be quoting many facts uh, during the course of this presentation. We're talking 1642. At the start of the year, Charles I tried to arrest five MPs in Parliament. Um, he failed, um, but as again many of you all know, this is the origin of the whole idea of Black Rod having to knock on the door of the House of Commons and um, to summon the MPs to the, the Queen's speech. This is the event that prompted it. January the 5th, essentially, Charles and Parliament fall out. There is then this very peculiar period in our history up to August the 22nd, when the Civil War officially started um, 
when Charles raises his standard at Nottingham. And nobody at that period really believed the war was going to happen. It was sort of a phony war. It was uh, almost like perhaps the start of the First World War, that people were just drifting into something they just didn't understand. Um, even as late as June, um, parliamentarians were essentially assuming that nobody was going to fight for the king. Whereas by October, you had a fully formed king's army advancing on London and presenting a real threat to, to Parliament. This war was not one that was planned, it was one we drifted into. I'd ask you to remember that date of August the 22nd, um, because that is vitally important when we come through to what was actually happening in Somerset. However, during that rather peculiar period, both Parliament and Charles were trying to build up military support in the country. On July the 10th, Charles appointed the Marquis of Hertford uh, to come to the southwest to raise troops. And nine days later, Parliament essentially tried to do the same thing. Uh, and again, it's quite interesting that they both selected local people. The Marquis of Hertford was a big landowner in Wiltshire, whereas Alexander Popham was in fact the MP for Bath at the time and a noted local Presbyterian. Um, so very different people, but sent to our part of the world to do exactly the same job. This is part of a letter and I'll uh, pause a bit to let you read it. Um, this is a letter from the Marquis of Hertford just before he set out from York, in fact, where the King was at the time, um, basically outlining how he saw the world at that particular point. So in other words, he was really quite optimistic. He wasn't talking about war. He was almost not contemptuous, but um, certainly not um, very strong in his opinions on, on the quality of the opposition at that time. Um, it's actually quite nice to have, have this sort of thing from the horse's mouth, as it were. He traveled down to the West Country here and initially went to Bath. Um, and I couldn't resist but put in a map of Bath at this point really to show you just how small the city was then. Had a population of about 2,000 people, which did actually make it one of the bigger places in Somerset. Um, you can see the river Avon curving round to the south and east of Bath. Um, obviously, the, um, the Abbey is very prominent, um, but you can just about see the um, the city walls that were still extant at the time, um, girding what was still then the urban population. Um, so that was Bath in about um, that period. Bath, as I've already implied, may not have been the best place for him to try and set his headquarters up. Um, having quite a strong Protestant ethic in, in the city. He arrived at a fairly bad timing insofar as the assizes were taking place when he arrived. Now in those days the assizes, the courts, um, were the scene of a quite big gathering of all the local bigwigs, all the local landowners came into the city for the assizes, it was quite a social occasion. Um, it also meant that people had the opportunity to talk to each other, to plot, to plan, and to generally make mischief if they were minded to. The Marquis, I think, pretty well soon picked up the vibes, um, came to the conclusion that he wasn't going to do very well uh, staying in Bath. So he very quickly moved his headquarters um, down the road to Wells. So, you know, very much staying in our local area. And this is when things really started to happen. The parliamentary 
representatives were summoning the local representatives of the various uh, villages and places to meet at Shepton Mallet on August the 1st. Now, if you remember, this is still three weeks before the official start of the war. Um, again, at that point, Shepton Mallet was a, a tiny place. I don't know the population, but it wasn't very big. And the rector at Shepton um, petitioned Hartford at Wells, saying basically that the local people were horrified at the possibility of this big gathering of parliamentarians and, and could he do something about it. So Hartford sent um, one of his officers down to, uh, down to Shepton with a body of cavalry. Said officer Hopton rode into the marketplace to face down what was by then an unruly rabble. A guy by the name of William Strode, who was a representative of the local parliamentary committee, ordered him to leave. Strode pulled him from his horse and arrested him just for treason. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Hopton arrested Strode, um, wrong way around. Hopton arrested Strode um, and had him arrested for treason and put in the uh, care of the local constable who was a parliamentarian supporter. The upshot of all this was that there was a face-off over several hours um, just outside um, Shepton. Um, and basically both parties withdrew uh, and Strode was immediately released. Parliament then set up a new rendezvous on the 5th of August, four days later, at Tewton Mendip. Um, which, as you will all probably know, is perhaps eight miles from where we are sitting today. Um, on the way to Tewton Mendip, to this gathering, there were 600 recruits coming from West Somerset in a group. They were intercepted by a soldier supporting um, the Crown just outside street. There was a contretemps of which seven men were immediately killed and many others were injured and many subsequently died. And they were the very first casualties of the Civil War, um, just outside street. And of course, we are still talking over two weeks before the war was officially declared. On the 5th of August at Tute Mendip, they reckon 12,000 men gathered, and I'll repeat that, 12,000, which for the period was an absolutely enormous gathering. Um, Chute and Mendip was only a tiny place then, as it's not much bigger now. They were enthusiastic. The local countryside was supporting them, were sending in food supplies, um, beer, were you know, really sort of uh, weapons, um, trying to support this gathering. Very unorganized, very, um, very odd. There are a few quotes um, of the um, gathering and it was decided at that point that they were going to march on Wells, which was something like four or five miles away. So they stayed all night on the hillside um, no cover, um, all ready to march on Wells, whereas you were gathered, remembered that Hartford, the royalist leader, was based. He had only managed to gather about 900 men, so it wasn't going to be very much of a fight if it did come to that. And he very wisely decided to, um, to, to get out while the going was good. Many of his men deserted anyway um, during the night that they were waiting and um, he, he, he got out uh, of um, Wells um, heading southwards. Eventually he had to leave Somerset altogether and catch a, a boat across to, uh, to Wales. This is a map that tries to indicate where the support for Parliament was in the county. 
Um, if you pick up any book um, on the subject, they've all pretty well got a map of similar lines to this, and none of them agree effectively. It was much more complicated than drawing wiggly lines on a map. Um, that if a local landowner supported the king, then almost by per chance, his, his, all his tenants and um, all his staff, if they wanted to keep their jobs and their land, had to support the king as well. Somerset, compared with most counties, had very few major landowners at the time. That um, it, it wasn't as if there were a lot of dukes or a big estates in the county. For many purposes during the Civil War, it's quite useful to link North Somerset with West Wiltshire, that they often worked in concert and um, you know, had different similar attitudes uh, to where they were. If we were quibbling, I, I would say if you're looking, if you can see Tewton Mendham almost in the middle of the map, I would say the line between support for Parliament um, and the rest of the county was further to the west. I think that um, you know, Blagden, Tewton Mendip, uh, were, and Wells obviously were, were far more in the parliamentary camp than, um, uh, than the map suggests. Wells is an interesting one, of course, because the cathedral and the staff of the cathedral um, did support the king. So again, it was a very much a split community. The white areas probably weren't terribly royalist, but they were much more neutral. They, they, they probably didn't care nearly so much what was going on. The, certainly, they wouldn't necessarily have supported the, the scene up on Tewton Mendip, um, which very much had the atmosphere of a, of a religious revival meeting almost. It was a very much at that point a, 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 a gathering based on religion. The two leaders, the parliamentary and the royalist, had both essentially come to the West Country for the same purpose, to gather military support. Now, military in those days, there wasn't a standing army in the country, um, that the only trained soldiers were called the trained bands. This was an organization that was set up in 1573 to um, withstand the Spanish invasion it's funded by a rate on each individual parish. It was controlled at a county level, um, organised by the local constables I already talked about, who seemed to get every duty under the sun that nobody else wanted. Their officers, inevitably, of course, were the younger members of the gentry. Um, they were supposed to meet one day a month for training and have an annual muster. Um, Absenteeism was rife, um, as you can probably imagine, one day a month training was not a lot of use when you probably had to travel quite some distance maybe to get to your buster station. Um, but, and this is a big but, it was the only organised military establishment in the country. It was better than nothing as far as both sides were concerned. Um, and there was, they were at least equipped. Now in Somerset, there were five regiments of train bands, um, and as you can see, there were 800 men in each, um, organised by neighbourhood. So three of them were based on Wells, Bath, Dilchester. Um, they were the local centres for those particular train bands. Taking Sir Ralph Hopton's Bath Regiment, uh, just as a, an example, he, as the leader, had a double company, so therefore 200 men rather than the standard 100. And his 200 men were drawn from over 40 villages in, in the area. Um, they met in Bath, so, for example, eight men were supposed to come from Canesham to Bath once a month for the training. Um, they a desultory shooting practice. Um, their weapons were stored and maintained at the Guild Hall, um, which is actually a far more professional setup than applied in many regiments. 
um, but it was pretty shambolic if one was going to be uh, brutal about it. They, there are a few quotes um, uh, about the, uh, the train bands and the local ones from Colonel Ward three years before the, uh, the Civil War actually started. Not a terribly high opinion, even of the officers. Now, <clears throat> what was Somerset like at the start of the Civil War? Um, and I, I quote at the top there from uh, one of the, um, the, the Protestant um, officers marching into the county of leaders. Population was something like 200,000, um, which compares to about 900 thousand or so people today. In the north where we are, then as now, it was dairy country, um, but they also grew corn. The south, where it was marshy very often, less well drained, uh, certainly on the levels and to the south of the county, it was more cattle and sheep country. There was quite a lot of mining for the time. Um, coal, not that far from us again, um, lead up on Mendip and so on. The Big E, was the cloth industry. This was the big income earner for Somerset at the time. All the major towns that you see listed there were textile towns um, where the merchants based in the town sent out piecework um, to all surrounding villages uh, and people worked on the looms and so on uh, where they were. The key factor on this was the cloth was usually exported. It was normally exported before the Thirty Years' War to the Low Countries, where it was dyed and finished. So we sent out um, the unfinished cloth uh, where it was finished off um, over there. Kersey, um, for those of you who don't know it, and I didn't actually look this up, um, again, it's a type of um, lighter wee broadcloth um, so not that dissimilar in fact but um, the, the, these places tend to specialize there were big quite important ports in the county bath even then was a almost a tourist place for the taking of the waters and paradoxically bath was one of the few places in the entire country that actually did moderately well out of the war because of course you've got a lot of people with injuries and illnesses and so on, who felt the need to, to take the waters, um, even though there was a war going on. And, and of course, there was a lot of local commerce, local markets were quite, um, uh, quite economically important. So as England went at the time, Somerset was quite industrial, economically very important, um, and a real prize for whichever side could dominate it. So just to remind you what the place looks like, there's a map of it. Um, so you've got you know, Taunton, Bridgewater and so on and so forth, and um, Blagdon up in the middle, up towards the north. Um, so that's where we were. It was of strategic importance to, again, both sides. The King brought his headquarters very soon down from the north and based himself for the entire Civil War at Oxford. So, in a way, the Southwest almost had its own private war. I mean, that is an exaggeration, but um, there was this axis that was very important down from Oxford through Gloucester. And of course, Gloucester was a key bridging point across the River Severn, so all the resources of Wales and so on were accessible via Gloucester. Bristol, key port, um, with an important hinterland. Um, you've got communication with Wales, you've got its affluence, as I've already said, as a source of tax revenue. It produced useful resources for a war, and it had dominated access to the rest of the West Country, especially Cornwall, because Cornwall was a key area of support for the Royalists. Don't ask me why, never understood it. 
Um, but obviously, even to this day, the um, heir to the throne is the Duke of Cornwall, uh, and that really is no coincidence. And uh, again, we will come on to the importance of Cornwall a bit later on. Bristol, though, was the big prize. At the time, Bristol was second only to London in terms of economic importance in the country, um, which uh, you know, really blows my mind anyway, in terms of uh, you know, try, trying to put it in its context. It was only a fraction of the size of London, but it was one of the few places in the country that, that could match it in terms of all the resources, the economics that uh, went with it. And I couldn't have, I couldn't resist putting in the picture there of old Bristol Bridge, which again is very similar in the way to London Bridge of the time with all the houses on it. Um, and apparently Bristol Bridge was where all the goldsmiths of the, uh, the city uh, had their houses and workshops and possibly for security reasons. So Bristol was a glittering prize for whichever side could take it. Then, and some people might argue, as of now, um, Bristol was dominated by the merchant venturers who then, and possibly as now, were more interested in turning a, a, a penny rather than getting involved too much in the politics of the country. And um, so Bristol tried for several months to be neutral, um, to basically carry on trading and, and making money. This is a contemporary map of Bristol. Um, and although the population was something like 15,000 people, you know, very big by the standards of the time, you can see again how relatively small it is in comparison to the sprawl we have today. So basically within a great loop of the two rivers, so you've got the River Froome um, to the north, the Avon to the south, and across the, the land between the two, in that circle, you can see the, the castle. And again, Bristol had the remains of its med medieval fortifications around the outside. But to the south, across the River Avon, across Bristol Bridge, um, again, you can see quite extensive suburbs. Um, and right on the edge, um, you've got some Mary Redcliffe. Um, so that was right on the edge of Bristol around about this time, you know, very different from where we are today. So Bristol, as I said, was the prize. At the time, it was a major manufacturing center um, and a manufacturing center of crucial importance to armies and armaments. It manufactured weapons, guns, gunpowder, milling, sugar refining, soap, rope, glass making, um, metallurgy, obviously, as I said, um, and it really was a wealthy place, heavily involved clearly in, in foreign trade, importation. It had a lot of ships based there, and ships were important for two reasons. First of all, the Navy, such as it was at the time, was entirely parliamentarian in its support. So it was very important for the royalists to acquire ships to run gauntlet of the navy blockades to bring arms in from abroad. And secondly, in those days, merchant ships had guns, cannon. And whereas it's relatively easy at the time for a blacksmith to produce a sword or a pike, and it's quite easy for a gunsmith to produce more um, small arms, producing cannon is a whole new ball game. And ships with their cannon were quite crucial in terms of supplying such equipment to the Royalists. So that's Bristol. Um, again, just to highlight on the left there how tightly packed it was. So you, you saw how small the area it covered was. But it was absolutely tightly packed with housing um, with people living cheap by jail. Um, and on that little map there, you see four churches, four parishes in, in a very limited area. And on the right, there's another map, but this time incorporating the 
new defences that were built during the course of the Civil War. And you can see the line all the way around the um, east, west and north of the city on the high ground. So in other words, Bristol itself wasn't terribly defensible because if you put a couple of cannon at the top of Park Street, um, then life was going to get very unpleasant very quickly. Um, so there were these outer defences built, they in much of a hurry um, to defend Bristol. Right, the war starts. The end of 1642 saw the Battle of Edge Hill, which um, you, most of you no doubt will have heard about, which was a real, real wake up call to both sides. It came to be seen as a draw, neither side really won. But both sides actually realised for the first time, perhaps, just how ghastly, just what the casualties were from a battlefield. And that was the end of their innocence, I suspect, as people. And after Edge Hill, the King's army marched on London, which of course would be their key objective. If they could have captured London, then that would have been end game. And they got as far as Turnham Green, which is um, about three stops from the end of the line or district line um, to the west of London, so it's pretty close in. Um, but at that point, the parliamentarians raised a sufficiently large army to dissuade Charles from advancing any further. And at least part of that was that he couldn't face the casualties that would accrue from uh, fighting in a built up area. So both sides decided they win it for the long haul. Um, the Cornish Royalists, as I said, Corn was very important, appointed their commander. And in February, Parliament appointed Sir William Waller um, for the five counties, which included Somerset. Now, you see, I promise you is about the last dates you're going to get uh, subjected to. Um, Broadly speaking, middle of 43 through to the middle of 45, broadly speaking, in our part of the world, the Royalists were in the ascendancy. After that, they declined very rapidly. What basically, basically happened was that um, in July 43, there was the Battle of Lansdowne, followed by Roundway Down, which is near Devizes. Lansdowne, of course, being just north of Bath, um, which were important locally. They led on to the Royalist ascendancy in this area. The Battle of Naseby, which was up in Northamptonshire um, in the middle of 45, destroyed the last major Royalist standing army in that part of the world. And it meant that the forces there could then be deployed down into Somerset uh, and so on, um, which led to ultimately the Battle of Lang Langport um, down to the south of the county, near just um, to the east of Taunton, um, which basically led to the end of the war, really, in this part of the world. That that's when the last Royalist army in this part of the world was destroyed and led, led on to. Um, Bristol being recaptured by Parliament. Now at this point, I am going to make a confession that life gets incredibly complicated, that in our part of the world, because we were on this fault line between support, because we were on these through routes, because we were an important um, area to raise taxes, our part of the world was fought over, um, garrisoned, taxed, pillaged in a confusing and bewildering number of ways. That pretty well any town of any size was occupied by one side or the other. Most of them changed hands during the course of those two or three years. Um, I could go on pretty well forever um, with a whole list of dates, places and so on and so forth, which I 
I don't intend to do, you'll be pleased to hear. But it's important to realise that in terms of the thrust of the talk from here on in, there's a lot of confusion going on around the key points that um, places like Taunton, Bridgewater, Wells, um, Shepton Mallet, wherever, 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 were garrisoned, were changing hands, were being fought over. Relatively small conflicts by um, you know, the standards of pitch battles. They weren't necessarily pitch battles. There were a few hundred men fighting were significant at local level and certainly very significant in terms of the small communities um, forced to support them. Very confusing situation. The strategy was to capture and hold these areas of population and make use of their resources. So you've got this conflict that you need garrisons to hold the populations, to hold these bits of land, but you also needed to have a large field army to basically fight other large field armies. So there was always this conflict between sending your armies out and diversifying it out into the countryside and keeping it together as a block, um, as a fighting force. Both sides use regional associations um, rather than having a national structure. As time went through, and again, we're really only talking two or three years, both sides got far more professional in terms of the way they organise themselves um, and the way they organise their resources. And the picture sort of shows the sort of level of a road of the period. Uh, and if you can imagine an army of, let's say, 10,000 men with lots of carts, cannon, um, camp followers, hangers on, all trying to get down that road. Um, you can imagine just how limited movement was. Armies of the time tended to move at say 10 to 12 miles a day, that was quite good movement. So um, things didn't happen fast. Um, <clears throat> a brief diversion in terms of how the wars were fought. You would basically got four arms of the military. On the left there, you've got pikemen with usually about 16 foot long pikes, um, which as you can see, formed a formidable barrier to cavalry or indeed anybody else provided the pikemen were unbroken. As soon as that um, line of pikes was broken into, then they were very vulnerable because of course the pikes were very unwieldy. <coughs> Cavalry started off by riding up in a gentlemanly fashion against the enemy, firing their pistols and then wheeling away to reload. That, as you can probably imagine, was not totally effective and subsequently well, there were the cavalry charges that we're more, more used to, uh, to understanding and seeing. Artillery was quite important, um, if only because artillery fire could break a square of pikemen uh, quite easily. You know, a, a cannonball hitting serried ranks of pikemen was not going to do them a lot of good. And finally, you had the muskets, which were um, usually arrayed either side of pikes. Um, very inaccurate very slow rate of fire, um, probably accurate up to perhaps 100 yards if you were lucky, and one round a minute rate of fire, but uh, that was the weapon they had at the time. As I've already implied, I think, the countryside was divided not along nice straight lines, it wasn't Somerset was one, Wiltshire was another, and this is a letter, part of a letter, from Ralph Hopton to his parliamentary adversary just before the Battle of Lansdowne. So you've got these two leaders who in better times had actually been on very good social terms. Really quite heartbreaking. Um, in terms of the local situation, um, the most important battle that took place was the Battle of Lansdowne, which, as most of you will probably know, is just to the north of Bath. The lead up to it um, was quite complicated, and I don't intend to go into too much detail. 
but essentially the parliamentarian army was moving up from the south, being to some degree chased and pursued by the royalists. And we are back, I'm afraid, to good old Chuton Mendip, you know, a place you um, probably not that familiar with, where the rear guard of the parliamentarian army um, had a quite bloody skirmish with the advancing royalists, um, mainly a cavalry uh, battle. Um, the royalists basically got the better of it, um, but, uh, and this will uh, ring bells, I'm sure, with you guys, um, the whole battle was brought to a halt when a Mendip mist descended towards evening. You know, the, the weather was the same then as it is now. Um, so Chuton Mendip um, was important again for, uh, and yes, another reason, uh, you know, the bloodshed uh, there. They ended up um, on Lansdowne Hill, as I say, to the north of Bath, where the two armies clashed fairly inconclusively, it has to be said. Um, and again, I, I'm not going to go into the, uh, the, the twos and fro's of the battle. Um, the Royalists moved off towards Devizes um, to head off towards London, pursued by the parliamentarians. There was a, a rematch, as it were, um, over, as I said, near, um, near Devizes. Um, where the royalists were utterly victorious, much against the odds. It really was a, a, a battle that um, strategists, even to this day, um, you know, teach in military colleges. The upshot of it was, though, that the trained bands, which made up much of um, Waller's parliamentarian army, were largely wiped out in that battle. So these guys who had um, been training once a month, you know, leaving their farms, leaving their wives um, to go off to war, a lot of them didn't come back from that battle near Devizes. Um, and it was really at that point, probably, that the local people realised that this was a, a, back, a war of the long term, but equally it wasn't anything at all. Um, that was um, in any way glorious. The, the picture on the right, again, many of you will recognise, is actually the tower um, on the site of the battlefield uh, north of Bath. And for those of you who haven't, it is actually quite worth visiting. Um, that, that whole area is quite, quite interesting. That battle near Devizes led to the Royalists being in the ascendancy in our part of the world. And on July the 26th, 1643, um, Bristol was attacked and seized by the Royalists. The um, parliamentarian um, governor surrendered fairly quickly that um, there, there wasn't as much fighting as was expected of him. And he was quite um, you know, criticised thereafter. But from that point onwards, Bristol was a royalist stronghold. Um, and indeed, as you can see from the pamphlet on the right, um, it was very much incorporated into the royalist propaganda at the time. It was a big deal. It meant a lot to the royalists. So for a year or more, Somerset was, broadly speaking, um, dominated by the Royalists, with exceptions. As I say, there were towns that held out, towns that changed hands, garrisons that uh, did so. And what I want to do really is to try and paint a picture, however imperfectly, of the effect of the war on the civilians of North Somerset in particular. And the impositions were many. I mean, you can see a list of them there, and I intend to go through them one by one in a way. It's important to say, though, that some places got hit far, far worse than others. But so much depended on the geography that if you were near a garrison 
then you are likely to be plundered, um, have taxations imposed upon you far more than if you're in the back of beyond um, and way off the, the, the main road network. Some places were absolutely devastated, other places got off pretty lightly. So a lot of generalization in what follows. Conscription. Um, this was um, something that both sides avoided at the start, but um, very soon afterwards, um, certainly from the end of 43, both sides were having to conscript. And, and what happened was a particular hundred, the basic unit of local government, was told to provide so many men. Um, and so the example there of uh, Berkeley um, in Gloucestershire, they were told to provide men to help garrison Bristol and Thornbury, which was another garrison uh, town in the area. They had to impose severe punishment for those men who refused, or very often those who deserted, a lot of desertion, and nobody really wanted to fight. Um, mathematicians better than I have estimated that um, those proportions of men served at some point um, of the war, and that something like maybe 10% of adult males were under arms at any one point in time. The country, in a way, couldn't support bigger armies, simply because, as I said in those days, Somerset and many other parts of the country were basically agricultural, and agriculture depended on horsepower and manpower to bring the crops in. Um, you couldn't actually have all the men off the land. When the war started, it was seen to be some sort of a gentlemanly, gentlemanly um, occupation, but that very soon died down. And just as an example, Wells, um, the parliamentary soldiers occupying it, um, did considerable damage to Wells Cathedral um, and the Bishop's Palace. Um, uh, and you've got two direct quotes there uh, as to what, um, what actually happened on, on two separate occasions. I have kept the original spelling you will have noticed, so I haven't uh, abandoned spell check. Taxation. Again, it was one of those things that the war started off with voluntary gifts being made on either side that um, the town might send a wagon of supplies to the parliamentarians um, if, they, if they were that way minded. Um, the, um, for example, the Oxford Colleges um, gave up most of their gold and silver plate as a donation to the king uh, to help pay for his soldiery. As the war progressed, these voluntary gifts obviously dried up and there was both sides imposed a system of weekly assessments so that each hundred and they're broken down by each parish had to pay so much a week towards the upkeep of the local army. Over and above that, and, and that was fairly formal, um, and people understood taxation in those days. Um, they were used to routine assessments um, for the parish for various functions. They were used even to one-off assessments to rebuild the road or um, something like that. So taxation wasn't alien to the population, but the level of it and the frequency of it certainly was. And certainly the populations on the boundaries between the parliamentarians and the royalists very often had both sides trying to tax the same village and certainly not taking the fact that you'd um, you know, given the Royalists five horses last week, that wasn't an excuse why we didn't want seven cows this week for the parliamentarians. Local garrisons, um, as I say, they were scattered all over the area. The big ones around here obviously were based on Bristol, um, but you have Bridgewater, um, Wells, um, so on, Bath. The demands by local garrisons were very often much less formal 
and they were very, very, very much issued with a threat of force. And you sort of uh, see a quotation at the bottom there as to the sort of comment that was made. The soldiers on both sides were very often not paid for months on end. And so even if they had wanted to, they were usually unable to actually pay for the, the beer, the food, the horses, the whatever they were demanding from the local population. Um, and, you know, a hundred guys with guns and swords landing on your doorstep, um, you're fairly unlikely to say, no, you can't have the keys to my beer cellar. Um, and then finally, there were taxes that were raised on basic commodities with varying degrees of success. Um, a lot of demands in terms of uh, monetary contribution, formal or informal. Just to give an example, again, the city of Wells, um, this is in a two month period over the summer of 1644. Um, and you can see there, there were five one off demands made of the city council over that period. Okay, I hope everybody's been a chance to read that. Again, I think it's always nice to actually have you know, the, the out of the horse's mouth, the actual words of the, you know, the people uh, involved. Brinton, just down the road, um, 1643, um, the Bristol garrison seized a, a large quantity of oats and beans from Yatton um, that were up for sale at Rington Market. No payment, um, just seized. Uh, and and that was that. Very often, um, not always, they seized these assets and did actually give um, a bit of paper um, saying that they would get paid at some future point. Now, these coupons, clearly given out by the Royalists, because they lost, had absolutely no value whatsoever when the parliamentarians won. Um, the parliamentarian ones they literally had claims going on for years and years and years after the end of the war, um, some of which were met, some of which were met in part, and, and some of which weren't. So it was, again, very much who you knew if you've got the support of your big local landowner and he knew the right people, then you might get repaid years later. Um, but uh, otherwise, tough luck. Um, there again is a quite a, an interesting case study, I think, of a blue cheese uh, that was um, all that was left in a house in Glastonbury. I rather like the idea that uh, you know this officer actually felt that uh, having his greyhounds with him, the greyhounds warranted uh, even better stuff than this blue ch cheddar cheese. But uh, yeah, there we go. Um, Free quarter, I mean, this was routine, that if you've got an army moving around the country, um, as I say, at various rates, very often about 10 miles an hour, they had to be put up by the local population. And so Twerton, situated, if you remember, between Bath and Bristol, on the main road, really got hammered. Um, and there are some examples of... Um, the number of men and the length of time that they had to put up soldiers uh, during the course of the war. Interestingly, some places appear to have got off scot free. Um, so, Thrubwell, for example, as, as far as we know, didn't actually have any soldiers billeted on it ever. Um, now, my theory is they never, they couldn't. They, you find the place, um, you know, again, like modern. Uh, Throbwell got off fairly lightly from. Um, at Wellow, um, during the siege of Bristol, 
10,000 men needed accommodation in the area of Wellow. And they ended up having 14 visits over a three month period from various units. Um, and they reckoned in their claim later after the war that the cost of it was 222 pounds time had about 30 houses. So what was left of the place after that lot had uh, passed through, I try to think, um, you know, probably not one stone standing on top of another. Um, again, it's a fairly long quotation, but again, I think it makes the point of um, how the soldiers could terrorise uh, the native population. You can imagine it, can't you? One thing that doesn't seem to have happened very often, um, which more modern wars does, is rape. That the soldiers do actually appear not to have been too misbehaving in that respect. Um, that hopefully the the constraints of a civil war that not all decency was was lost uh, and of course i suppose in a far more religious age than ours um they, 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 their morality in that respect was uh, particularly among the protestants anyway was um far, far more uh, the puritans sorry was um far more important than it might be in subsequent wars um that's the continuation of that last quote um, I like the idea that they, they wouldn't lie too to a bed as uh, others have done. But there we go. Um, so that was that's again is a sort of a direct quotation from somebody there on the day. Sieges again were um, not common, but happened. Um, as I've already indicated, that um, Bristol was um, seized towards the start of the war by the Royalists. When the new model army, the, the Puritans, came in the middle of 1645, they made the promise at the top there and very largely kept to it that the discipline in the new model army was, for the period, absolutely brilliant. At the bottom, the siege of Taunton was notorious. Um, Taunton was held by the Puritans, um, by Parliament, and it withstood a royalist siege of 94 days in 1645. Uh, and by the time they'd finished, all the townsfolk were starving. Uh, many of the garrison were dead or badly wounded. Two thirds of the houses were burned. I mean, Taunton was basically destroyed in that time. Um, and e even the thatch off the roofs were used to feed the horses. Now, I love the idea that the bed cords, you know, the cords that were used to support the um, mattresses on the beds, um, had to be taken off to provide the match for the, um, the, 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 the um, musketeers to use in their muskets and on, their, um, on their guns. Um, when the new model army arrived to capture Bristol, um, Yes, they, by the standards of the time, were exemplary, but still there was a lot of um, requiring of assets of the surrounding area, uh, as you can see there. But um, Bedminster, in particular, suffered mightily 
both from the demolition by the royalist garrison who obviously tried to clear the field of fire and so on um, but also um, all the surrounding villages had to uh, provide resources for the attacking force um, there's again a, a threat as to what would happen um, if um, you, you didn't put up with the, uh, the troops that were imposed on you. Again, it very much depended on the local circumstances. A good officer who had control of his troops, um, they would be a very different proposition from one with the attitude like that, or troops that hadn't been paid for a year um, and who were basically out to get what, whatever they, they could from the neighbourhood. And of course, the entire war and particularly for Somerset, meant there was total disruption of trade, that you know, the foreign export of cloth um, pretty well stopped, um, that even within the country, a lot of the bridges, a lot of the bridges across the rivers were knocked down as defensive measures. Um, and so traveling not only was very dangerous, that your goods might be seized, <clears throat> but was almost impossible with carts when bridges had disappeared. So what happened towards the end of the war was that in some areas, this organization was set up called the Club Men. And North Somerset and West Wiltshire was one of the centers where this happened considerably. And this was essentially local people banding together, organized quite often by the local priest or um, somebody like that essentially just to defend their own village, their own farms, their, their own assets from being stripped and taken away by whichever invading force that they were nominally anyway, totally independent of by, by the royalists or parliamentarians. So if you offer to plunder or take our cattle, be assured we will bid you battle and um, was one of their flags that was actually local to here. Um, the records of the clubman for the Canesham hundred um, still exist. So Chew Stoke and Throbwell both sent uh, financial contributions to support the local organization. And Chew Magna um, had about 40 men who went and volunteered to be part of the, uh, the organization. Not well armed, not well organized but in significant numbers. And it really made rampaging soldiers think twice. Um, before they actually um, seized what they wanted to. And towards the end of the war, both Fairfax, the parliamentarian leader, and indeed Charles I did actually negotiate with the clubman um, on a fairly serious basis um, to keep um, you know, keep them on side and um, not attacking their soldiers. Um, so just as one example before I move on, the Royalist Garrison of Devizes was very much constrained by a thousand clubmen organised together when they went out trying to seize um, food and resources from the area around Devizes. So it did work to a degree. The war, inevitably, as you know, came to the end. Charles I was executed and we went into a unique period in English history where we were a republic for a while. So what you then got, as I've already hinted, was during the reign of Parliament, people who had fought for the royalist cause were very often heavily fined they were sometimes stripped of their estates and um, some of them went into exile and similarly people who had provided resources for parliament 
or had fought for Parliament, stood a reasonable chance of being reimbursed for their troubles. When Charles II was restored in 1660, the situation, of course, was reversed. And although, by and large, he was fairly moderate in terms of the changes he made, at that point, it was worthwhile going to court and saying, my dad fought for your dad. Um, we lost 23 head of cattle. Please, can I, you know, have 100 acres of land or something? So it was very much who you knew, what you knew, um, and how the line, land lay. It did have sort of implications and repercussions um, that went on way beyond the actual fighting. One group of people who I've not mentioned and who were heavily involved in the war, albeit in an um, ecclesiastical way, were the local clergy. And just as an example we have here is William Thomas, who was the rector of Ubley um, from 1617 onwards. He was quite a strong Presbyterian. I'm sorry, not Presbyterian. Um, yeah, Puritan anyway, in his, his attitudes. Um, he was removed in 1635 for refusing to read from the pulpit, as he was supposed to do, um, the Book of Liberty for sports on the Lord's Day. Um, you know, he, he reckoned that the Lord's Day should be kept uh, and for prayer and uh, long sermons. Um, got back in. Um, in 1643, when the Royalists, as I've already indicated, tended to dominate this area, he um, was stopped from preaching and, in fact, moved to London. Of course, heavily parliamentarian in his outlook in London. Um, at the end of the war, he was able to come back and got a job at uh, Wells and resumed his duty in Ubley. Um, but then, um, when Charles II came back to the throne, um, he introduced a new prayer book in 1662, and William Thomas had problems with that and was removed from the parish. So they have just got one example of a local guy who um, stuck by his principles, and sometimes was in the ascendancy, sometimes was suffering for them. Um, and I'd just like to say, yeah, a thank you to Anne Simnett for uh, providing information on, on, on this fascinating guy. Um, before we go on to questions, if there are any, I'd just like to sort of bring it back, really. I hope I've given a strong impression how heavily Somerset suffered during the war. It wasn't just or indeed mainly a question of big battles. It was this attrition. This was local soldiers coming through. It was your cattle being seized. It was your um, barn being broken down, whatever, whatever, whatever. It is reckoned that across the country, 190,000 people died as a result of the Civil War. Most of them from starvation, illness, disease, rather than pitch battles. The area around us, um, it's pretty difficult to say quite what happened. Um, the records are not complete, but certainly based on what we know, Blagton probably got off fairly lightly. Um, but although we're not that far away from the old route from Wells to Bristol, um, which um, you know goes um, to come to Martin. We're not that far away from the road from Bristol to Bridgewater, going through Churchill. Um, I think we were probably sufficiently off the main route that we got off broadly fairly lightly. But um, the country as a whole suffered hugely. That's all I've got to say. I think, as I say, there's vast amounts more material that I've skimmed over. But um, are there any questions before we uh, cease? Ken, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Anybody who's got any questions of Ken, please unmute yourselves and, uh, and pitch in. Nobody at all? Hello. Um, can you see me? Yeah. 
Hi, Jackie. Hi, thank you very much, Ken. That was great. Can I um, just ask you, Cromwell, I don't think you mentioned, was no. he, was there a good reason? <laughs> I'm sure there was. Um, essentially, I was trying to concentrate on what was going on in our part of the world rather than um, the rest of the country. Um, yes. And the, the local, the, the leader of the, um, the New Model Army when it came through to um, this part of the world was Fairfax. Cromwell yes more junior to Fairfax um, and therefore um, I didn't actually mention him but he was involved he was Fairfax's deputy in fact. Um, mm, okay thank you. So um, and, and obviously subsequently Cromwell um, became the more important one. Hello sorry I can't see yes go on. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear you? Yes. It's Janet Maskell. I wanted to ask you what the picture we were looking at last. The last yes. it's, it's actually Corfe Castle. Oh, right. Okay. It was a strong royalist outpost during the war and was after the war when it was Parliament. Um, and they had problems blowing it up. That uh, if, it, if it, there's one tower where essentially it was almost lifted bodily off its foundations and still didn't disintegrate um, but yeah. it's been ever since the civil war oh gosh ken thank you very much very interesting thank you thank you if anybody wants an interesting um visit uh if you go to christmas steps in uh, in bristol um, up behind the Hotel de Vin on the centre, you can find your way up to the top of Kingsdown Hill um, and in the middle of the little sort of um, area of gracious housing in Kingsdown there's a, a monument that tells how that was the high point uh, that was critical for the cannons to protect troops coming from the east, from Bath. And, and it, it tells the story of the, um, I think the parliamentarians attacking the Royalists, or it might have been the other way around, when Christmas steps were running with blood uh, right. from, top, from top to bottom. Yeah. And you do get that. a very, very good view. <laughs> Thank you. Certainly when, um, the first siege, when uh, um, Parliament was seizing it from the Royalists, um, they basically came down um, Park Street. Um, uh, and again, you can just imagine the sort of the forces coming, coming down there. And um, you, as you say, you sort of horses clattering down, firing, cannon fire down from the hills around. Um, you know, very different position from what you see today. Any more? Just unmute, unmute yourselves. Pip, did you want to say something? I just wondered, at the beginning, Ken, you mentioned that the King went to Parliament to arrest some MPs. Yes. But why, why was that? What well, I didn't quite grasp. Okay. The uh, essentially, the King um, was in dispute with Parliament, essentially on who could raise taxes. And um, Parliament, were, or certain members of Parliament, were in considerable dispute with him. He basically wanted to take the law in his own hands and arrest the ringleaders of what he saw as a rebellion. Ah. And so he went to Parliament to, the, the leader of them was Pym, in fact. Mm. Uh, they had been forewarned that the king was coming and ah. <laughs> had gone into the city of London and gone lied low there. So the king, ah. his soldiers and, and the, um, the speaker of Parliament at the time I um, can't remember the exact quote, but there was a fairly famous quote that he um, basically told the king that he was a servant of uh, the parliament, not the king, and wasn't going to shop where these uh, 
five MPs were. All oh, right. Yeah. So th that essentially was the final straw that led to the rift between the King Parliament. The King left London a few days later, went up to York, um, leaving Parliament essentially in control of the Queen's Waters of London. And as I said at the time, even today, the monarch is not allowed to go into the Houses of Parliament, um, to the House of Commons. Yeah. So when Queen's speech, the Commons have to go from the Commons to the Lords, where the Queen can preside, um, mm -hmm. rather than um, listening to her in the Commons. And there's this rod knocking on the door and so on. Right. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Any more? Well, there's no more questions or people have forgotten how to unmute themselves. <laughs> it's, uh, it's nearly nine o'clock, so I think we probably... Okay, Ken, thank you very much. As, as previously, we, we have been recording this and uh, hopefully this one we have not had problems with. My machine has behaved itself and it's been recorded into the cloud. So um, short, in a short while, um, we will be able to supply a link so anybody who wants to look at bits again or who missed it or part of it will actually get a chance to listen again to the, uh, to the presentation. Otherwise, thank you all. We, we hit nearly 50 people at the peak, um, which was very good. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I don't know what happened to the picture.